On March 13, 2018, U.S. President Donald Trump was giving a speech to members of the military in San Diego when he spoke about the need for America to have a space force to go along with the other branches of the military, the Air Force, the Army, Navy, etc. Here's his speech. You know, I was saying it the other day because we're doing a tremendous amount of work in space. I said, maybe we need a new force. We'll call it the Space Force. And I was not really serious. And then I said, what a great idea. Maybe we'll have to do that. That could happen. Okay, I don't think he's serious. He was trolling the media. Well, I'll bite. Let's talk about a space force. What kinds of warfare could happen in space? What kind of technology and equipment already exists? What laws exist to cover space warfare? Space is the ultimate high ground, and the last half of the 20th century was all about conquering space for military purposes. If you can launch a satellite into space, you can loft a nuclear weapon halfway across the Earth to hit a target on another continent. The engineering is pretty much the same. The space race was as much about demonstrating mastery over spaceflight as it was about the scientific accomplishment of putting humans on the moon. But the reality is that the militarization of space began the moment the first satellites were sent into orbit. Every few months, another military satellite heads to space, whether it's a global positioning system, a surveillance satellite, or a secure communications platform. And the military has tested anti-space weapons. In 2007, China tested an anti-space missile system, destroying their own broken down weather satellite. A kinetic impactor smashed into the satellite, going eight kilometers per second. Similar technologies have been tested by the U.S., and at this point, it's probably safe to assume that many nations have the ability to destroy or damage satellites in orbit. What kinds of weapons are you allowed to put into space? There are absolutely international treaties that cover this kind of thing, specifically the use of weapons of mass destruction in space. Article 4 of the treaty states that parties may not place in orbit around the Earth any objects carrying nuclear weapons or any kinds of weapons of mass destruction, install such weapons on celestial bodies, or station such weapons in outer space in any other manner. The Moon and other celestial bodies shall be used by all states parties to the treaty exclusively for peaceful purposes. The establishment of military bases, installations, and fortifications, the testing of any type of weapons, and the conduct of military maneuvers on celestial bodies shall be forbidden. The use of military personnel for scientific research or for any other peaceful purposes shall not be prohibited. The use of any equipment or facility necessary for peaceful exploration of the moon and other celestial bodies shall also not be prohibited. Satellites carrying nuclear weapons are out. Military bases on the moon, out. Secret civilian installations where they test alien-human hybrids are fine, but they can't be run by military personnel looking to create a secret army of super soldiers. And it can't be nuclear alien-human hybrids. Of course, space is used by the military all the time, in plenty of different ways that get around these rules. The global positioning system that helps you navigate with your phone started out as a military technology. In fact, until a few years ago, the US military had been making the GPS slightly more inaccurate on purpose to make it less useful to its enemies. The Europeans have their own version called Galileo, the Russians have GLONASS, and there are other networks from China, Japan, and India. So space is used to help the world's militaries navigate. But these technologies also have civilian uses, and from what I understand, None of them have nuclear weapons on board. Space is also used for surveillance and reconnaissance. The U.S. Air Force has a network of telescopes as powerful as Hubble, staring down at the surface of the Earth. It's all robotic now, but there were originally plans to launch astronauts to secretly spy on the Soviets from space. Early on in the space race, the U.S. National Reconnaissance Office was developing a manned orbiting laboratory that would have sent American astronauts into orbit to spy on the Soviet Union using powerful telescopes and cameras. It would have been constructed from rockets and Gemini capsules, and its public purpose would be to conduct scientific experiments on astronauts in space. Now, apart from an unmanned test flight in 1966, the idea was scrapped, and the NRO recently declassified tens of thousands of pages of photographs on the project. It's 
really fascinating stuff actually. You're not allowed to launch nuclear weapons into orbit, but that doesn't mean that you can't try out other weapons. In 1987, the Soviet Union launched the Polyus Skiff spacecraft from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. The satellite was equipped with a megawatt carbon dioxide laser weapon that would be tested to see how well a space-based laser system could take out a US intercontinental ballistic missile. The satellite failed to reach orbit, so the Soviets never got a chance to test out this weapon. But even if it had reached space, it probably wouldn't have ever been used. Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev was concerned that it would be seen as a space weapon and incite a diplomatic crisis. The US was considering its own space-based anti-missile systems at the time, testing powerful lasers from the ground that would be bounced off mirrors in space. The U.S. also tested a particle beam aboard a sounding rocket and demonstrated that the weapon could be fired from space. The Brilliant Pebble system was proposed in the 1980s and would involve thousands of small missiles placed in high orbits. At any time, many of them would be flying over the Soviet Union. And in the case of an ICBM launch, the missiles could hone in on the energy signature of the rocket and collide with a kinetic impactor. But how do you know the difference between a weapon and a broom? Earlier this year, an engineer at China's Air Force Engineering University suggested the idea of launching a satellite that could zap nearby space junk with a powerful infrared laser. At a rate of up to 20 bursts a second, the laser would vaporize tiny pieces of space junk acting like a tiny rocket that would lower its orbit. By this method, space junk could be deorbited and the overly congested low Earth orbit could be cleaned up. But obviously, a laser system that can deorbit, say, a spent rocket booster can also deorbit a perfectly functional surveillance satellite. What about non nuclear weapons in space? Of course, if you had the energy and patience, an asteroid would make a devastating weapon, although a little hard to control. Military thinkers have considered launching telephone pole sized tungsten rods into space. These could be used as kinetic impactors, returning from space with enormous energy. They would release as much energy as a nuclear weapon without all the troublesome radioactivity and fallout. The idea was shelved because of the expense of launching that much mass into space. Oh, and I can imagine the UN quickly modifying their legislation, banning space weapons to include devastating kinetic impactors capable of nuclear weapon levels of destruction. Oh, and no asteroids either. And comets are right out. Don't even think about it. Since space is already so militarized, what would a space force even do? What role would they play in the militarization of space? And we'll get to that in a second. But first, I'd like to thank Andy Marks, Andrew McMurray, COD FM, Derek Kelly, and the rest of our 816 patrons for their generous support. If you love what we're doing, you want to get in on the action, head over to patreon.com slash universe today. Now, let's talk about the Space Force. In 2017, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the National Defense Authorization Act. One section included legislation that would require the Air Force to create a new branch of the military called the Space Corps by 2019. Well, here's the thing. There's already a Space Force. It's called the Air Force. They already handle any military matters that have anything to do with space. Reconnaissance, communications, navigation, espionage, and counterespionage. We're not at the point where people will fly to space piloting their fighters and engaging in space dogfights. Actually, I've added a bunch of videos about what space warfare might actually look like at a playlist at the end of this video, so check that out. The National Defense Authorization Act didn't actually set aside any budget for the Space Corps, but the Pentagon would need to hire someone to start working out the details for what the Space Corps would be. This would make a sixth branch for the U.S. military, but it would essentially be just shifting existing operations around. Of course, this new legislation didn't make the Air Force happy since Air Force Space Command currently handles all American military space operations with their reconnaissance and navigation satellites. Did you know the U.S. Air Force has their own unmanned space shuttle? The X-37B. They've launched into space five times now with one mission lasting over 719 days. It launched in September 2017, and it's up there right now doing, I don't know what. Seriously, if anyone knows what this thing does, please tell me. And on another note, did you know that the W-1st, the next generation space telescope that will come after Hubble, 
and James Webb was built out of an Earth observation telescope that the Air Force didn't need anymore. A Hubble-class telescope that they didn't want because it wasn't good enough for them. Space is the ultimate high ground, and the military has been using it from the earliest days of the space age. And the Space Force is already here. They just look like people working on computers, controlling satellites. As we push out deeper and deeper into the solar system, we can expect the military to continue the journey with us. Let's hope the UN updates their treaties and space is used as peacefully as possible. Well, how would you adapt international laws to account for the future of the military in space? I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments. Once a week, I gather up all my space news into a single email newsletter and send it out. It's got pictures, brief highlights about the story, and links you can find out more. Go to universetoday.com newsletter to sign up. And now, here's a playlist all about that space warfare I was talking about.